Hello, I'm Arthur Gibbs, the Arden Pathfinder Club Director, Arden, North Carolina, and we are in the midst of quarantine. We are sent to our homes due to this COVID virus, and we were going to do actually the virus honor. I was going to teach it on Sabbath there at Workbee in Carolina at Nasoka, and I've been asked to go ahead and try to do it online, so I'm going to try to do that today and just share a little bit with you. So, what you're going to need to know is some of this, what this on the screen, you want to go to this website, our ardenpathfinders.org website. There you'll see a link that you can click to for honors and you'll be able to download the worksheet for the honor. If you want to do the virus pathfinder honor, you will need this worksheet that you'll be able to do with it. it tries to go over all the main content that I'm sharing and it should give you all the resources you need pretty much to do the honor. You want to put your name and start getting ready to write the answer. So make sure you print this off. It's about nine pages or so, and you'll want to be able to do that. And second of all, these are my contact information. I currently work at Fletcher Academy. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a microbiologist. I'm just a simple Pathfinder director, but I have done a little bit of research on viruses, and I want to share what little bit I know with you to try to help all of us be a little bit more educated about it. Here's my email address, arthur at abible.com. My mobile phone number, if you want to call me, text me, 828-708-4885. And of course, today's date is March 28, 2020, because virus information can change rapidly. So if this presentation is out of date, at least you'll know I did my best when I did it. So, viruses, let's jump in. Imagine, under the cover of darkness, an enemy spy invades silently across the border. Invisible to the guards, the spy creeps cautiously along the edge of the road, sneaks by the cameras, breaks into the empty main computer room. Once he's in the computer room, he has control of everything. In a way, that's kind of what a virus is. A virus is something that sneaks into our main control room, inside the very cells of our body, takes over the functions of that cell, and causes it to do its dirty work, which usually, in the case of a virus, is to simply make more of the virus. But since it takes over all of our regular processes and all the controls we normally do, we don't have the energy, we don't have the good health to do the stuff that our body would normally want to do. So, let's talk a little bit about viruses. So basically what you're going to have, again, is this worksheet, and you just simply write in the answers. Usually the answers will be in yellow, to highlight what you're missing on your worksheet. So a virus, by definition, is simply a tiny, very tiny, non-living, we'll talk about that, there's a little debate there, but generally most scientists will say non-living, it's a parasite. A virus has a tendency to live off other things, which is kind of sad. Parasite that invades and then multiplies inside a living cell. So if you look on your worksheet, this is question one. These are the answers to the definition of virus there for question one. A virus is a tiny, non-living parasite that invades, multiplies inside uh, a living cell. Uh, the word virus actually comes from the Latin, which means poison. Uh, if you want to study viruses, there's actually a, a branch of science called biology. Um, it's actually a subspecialty of microbiology, which is a course a lot of people take, especially if they want to be a doctor, uh, even nurses. A lot of medical professionals would take microbiology in college. So it's, it is a, a whole branch of study. And there's other substances, too, that are similar to viruses, bacteria, fungus. We're going to look at that and, and try to separate and explain the differences between those here today. So first of all, let's get into the big debate. Are viruses living things, or are they non-living? Um, and I'll be honest, this is confusing, right? Even to regular scientists sometimes, because they'll talk about killing the virus, but they'll also say a virus isn't living. How do you kill something that isn't alive? So there's a lot of confusion. Most of us know what living things are, right? You think of things like plants and animals. You think of us, humans, right? You think of fungus, you think of uh, little tiny, teeny, teeny animals, you know, little one-celled animals or even bacteria, even those are considered living things. And then most of us know the non-living things, right? Things like water, dirt, you know, the soil, the air, minerals, light, rocks, 
these are things that aren't living. They might have been living at one time. You know, for example, some of these rocks might have been a petrified tree, might have been a tree at one time, but now it's become a rock. Uh, but most of these are things that while they might be used to generate life and to keep life going, you know, we use water, we breathe air, but these aren't living things, right? These aren't usually considered living things. So which category would you put the virus in? Well, what I have on your sheet here is a little chart, right? And on one side, we have things that we normally consider as definitions of living things. And on the other side, on the right side there, we have a list of things that are normally considered descriptors of non-living things. So let's, let's look at these two, because viruses actually have things in common with both groups. So, first of all, when you think of a living thing, usually it's complicated in its structure, made up of lots of parts. It's usually complicated. A non-living thing is often very simple. If I had a glass of water here, all the molecules in that water are probably the same right? They are. They're going to be H2O. Pretty simple structure, pretty uniform. It's all one thing. Even our rocks, while it might have a lot of little teeny pieces of minerals or some different things in it, compared to a plant, compared to an animal, are a whole lot simpler. Well, viruses, which one would you consider it to be? Believe it or not, most viruses are considered complicated, compared to a rock, that is compared to a piece of dirt, compared to the air molecules, water molecules, viruses can be kind of complicated. They have parts to them. Um, they have uh, genetic code in there. They've got all these things that make you sit there and go, hmm, there's something more to this than just a piece of non-living matter. Um, viruses can also adapt to their environment, okay? That's not something that you think of when you think of a non-living object. A rock sitting out, right, it just sits there. If it's hot, the rock is hot. If it's cold, the rock is cold. Okay, it just sits there. It doesn't really react. It just has to deal with whatever the environment is and it often becomes more like the surrounding environment. Viruses are able to do a little bit like you and I do. It's able to adapt and change. If it's under the right environment, it's able to do something different. It's able to reproduce. It's able to invade a host. If it's in a hostile environment, it's able to just kind of go dormant and wait until a better environment uh, is provided. Viruses do have DNA. They do have, some of them have DNA, some have RNA, some have both. They do have genetic material. By definition, all viruses have some sort of genetic material. Now this is a building block for life, right? You and I have DNA in it, animals have DNA, even plants have this genetic material in them that allows them to reproduce. So this is pretty big. That's why some people will say that viruses are almost kind of like a living thing. It's got, it's got genetic material. That's pretty rare. You don't see that in rocks. You don't see that in water. Um, are viruses able to reproduce though? Well, now here's where it differs. See, if you just looked at these three, you might think that a virus is a living thing. But let's keep going. These are big. Viruses are not able to reproduce on their own. They have to have help. They have to have another host, another cell that they invade before they're able to reproduce. I actually wrote in my notes that it reproduces with help. Um, you could just put reproduces with question marks. It, it doesn't really reproduce on its own. It doesn't, um, just like a non-living object would. Now let's go to four more here. Um, is it able to use energy? Well, again, viruses use energy with help, not on their own. If they're just left out on a table surface, they don't reproduce. They don't use any energy. Uh, if you see a virus and it's on a slide underneath a microscope, if it's on your hands, it doesn't reproduce, it doesn't use any energy, it doesn't really do anything. But once that virus gets inside a living organism, right, a body, a human, an animal, it will go inside those living cells, take over the cell, the command center of that cell, use the cell to generate energy, use that cell's machinery to reproduce itself, to make copies of the virus, which then go out and invade more human cells. Do viruses have cells of their own? Absolutely not. And this is probably the biggest reason why most scientists will tell you viruses are not living organisms. They're acellular, meaning no cells, no cells. So 
So I just simply wrote on mine here, no, no cells. There's, there's no cells inside a virus. They're actually so small that they can fit inside a cell. So they're very, very tiny. Um, do they ever grow? Not really. They can reproduce, again, with the help of a cell, but viruses don't grow or get bigger or go from a baby virus to a, to a mommy virus, a daddy virus. That's not what viruses do. Bacteria grow, you and I grow, animals, plants grow. Most living things, pretty much all living things grow or at least have the cap capability to grow. Uh, viruses do not. And then last but not least, uh, respond to stimuli. No, they don't. Living things usually do respond, right? If you poke them, ouch, you know? They have nerves, they have the ability to sense, they have the ability, some of them can move on their own. Even a plant, while we don't normally think of it as something that can move on its own, it can respond to sunlight, right? If the sun is shining, the tree will kind of lean over, the leaves will grow over a certain way because they want to respond to that bright light. They want to get that stimulus of, of more sunlight that will help them grow and be healthy. Living things can respond to stimulus. Non-living things do not. Viruses do, do not. So, so if you look at those eight things there, you'll see the picture is a little convoluted, a little difficult to, to, to totally agree on everything. But generally speaking, because they don't have any cells, because they can't reproduce on their own, they can't use energy on their own, they don't grow, they don't respond to stimulus, the majority of those, they're non-living things. They are complicated, they can adapt, and they do have genetic material, which makes them kind of in a category all by themselves. But most scientists would say this, viruses are not classified into any of the five animal kingdoms, the life kingdoms, uh, life kingdoms. Animals is one of those, right? Plants is another, you know, you know some of the main kingdoms, bacteria, small forms of life. These are all things that, that we consider to be living, living beings of. Even fungus is a, a considered a living thing. Viruses are not one of these five big kingdoms of living beings. They're not in those categories. They're in a, in a branch of microbiology all by themselves. Um, so what is unique about viruses? What do they have in common? Well, let's look at a few things. Number one, they have a protein. So 5A, you got three answers here for five. So we're going to want to put um, three things here. Oh, I should mention number four. I didn't have a slide on it there, but uh, Dmitry uh, Ivansky was the very first person, a Russian botanist, who discovered viruses back in the late 1800s there. And he discovered that there's this little virus that was invading tobacco plants. And he was able to actually kind of see it and figure out what it was. And now we know there's over 5,000 different species of virus all over the world, including the virus that causes the flu, influenza, uh, this new COVID virus that uh, everybody's very nervous about right now, measles, mumps, there's a lot of diseases, a lot of conditions, polio that we know of today that are all caused by viruses. Now there's also viruses that just plants get, there's viruses that just certain animals get, so there's viruses for all kinds of organisms on planet Earth. If viruses were considered a living being, they literally would be the most populous organism on the planet. So they are worthy of our study and they are worthy of, of some of our understanding. So number five here though, the three things that they all have in common. Number one, they have a protein coat that protects the outside of the virus. And inside of that virus, they have a core that contain, contains genetic material, a, a building block, a code on how to reproduce itself, how to make more virus that's just like itself, just like it. And then lastly, there's also this surface on the outside also has the ability to attach to a host. And that is key, right? Because not only is it able to protect itself, but then it's also able to attach and invade other living cell, you know, other living cells, especially the ones that are in our body. Now, let me give you an idea, just a rough estimation of how big and how small viruses really are. So on the right here, is a particle of dust that basically would be almost too small for your eyes to see. This would be the smallest, tiniest, little speck of dust. And a red blood cell, which most of you probably have never seen with the naked eye, right? There's no way. You're going to need a microscope to be able to see that, is smaller than this speck of dust. And then, and then here is even a smaller 
speck of dust, right? I mean, this is like literally one of the smallest specks that we ever bothered. To. This big one over here, this is what smoke is made out of. You ever seen smoke at a campfire? Uh, it's made up of tiny particles like this. You never thought of that. Smoke looks like it's just a gas. It's actually little particles in the air. Then you've got a bacteria, right? And then there's you, the coronavirus, the latest virus that's uh, causing a lot of panic right now in the United States and, and around the world. And then the smallest particle that's able to be filtered by some of these masks that you see healthcare workers wear. And you can see that's why we wear masks, especially when you're a healthcare provider. It's able to filter out this tiny little particle. But the coronavirus, the influenza virus, all these different viruses are so, so tiny. They're even smaller than a piece of bacteria, smaller than it does, smaller than our own cells in our body, red blood cells, other cells, tiny, tiny, tiny little things. Um, so viruses number six here, turn the page on my worksheet. Viruses are very, very small, sub-microscopic, right? They go from very tiny. Now, there, there obviously is different sizes, but if you think of a human hair, um, back on this screen here, a human hair would be about the size of this screen, <laughs> all right? If we had a big piece of hair and cut it in half, it would be about, about three-fourths the size of this screen. So think of your hair and then think of how tiny that, that bacteria is and then how tiny, even tinier than that, the virus is. Very, very, very small. So we're talking very small. And yet, if you look at this virus, it has some very interesting, this is a picture of a virus right here. You got the protein coating, you got some genetic code on the inside, and then you got kind of this scary structure here that allows it to be able to attach. Here's a microscopic picture, right? Here's a cell, okay, a human cell, and this right here is a virus. And you can see where it is attaching itself to the wall of this cell. And what it's gonna do, it's gonna take its genetic code in the head here and inject it into this cell and take over the functions of this cell. At least that's what it's gonna to try to do. Now, there's a whole nother um, branch, not just of viruses, but there's also these things called prions, which are even smaller than virus, okay? They're almost like a piece of a virus. Okay, little tiny things. They don't have DNA. They're very rare, but they also still cause some diseases. Have any of you ever heard of mad cow disease? All right, mad cow disease is not actually caused by a virus, but by a prion, which is a tiny, 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 even smaller than a virus substance. And there's some theories that eating meat uh, from a mad cow, a cow that's been infected with mad cow disease could actually cause uh, a similar disease in, in humans. So we do want to be uh, aware of that, but it's pretty rare, very rare. Mad cow disease is very rare among cows and, and even more so among, among people, the, the one that attacks the people. So, um, so let's overview this. Let's look at this a little bit. These are some of the small things that can hurt us, okay? So the largest thing over there on the left is a parasite. Now that's something you could actually see, all right? A tapeworm, you could actually see one of those in your hand. Protozoa going to be pretty hard to see. A one-celled animal, you can see it under a microscope, but it's pretty small. And then fungus causes things like athlete's foot, uh, different things like that. Sometimes some rashes are caused by that. Um, it's going to be a tiny little piece. And then you've got bacteria. Bacteria are actually small little animals that invade our body and make us sick, use up our body's energy, our resources, cause us to get sick. And then a virus is even smaller, right? Now, all these on the left, okay, are cellular, considered living things. Other animals, other organisms that are attacking us and hurting us. But these two on the right, the virus and the prion, are considered acellular, non-living. Uh, virus would be influenza, polio, AIDS, coronavirus, and the prion, pretty much the only, the only one that we really talk about much is the, the mad cow disease, um, which has a, the, the human form of that is CJD. Um, which uh, we could talk about another time. So viruses can have all kinds of shapes. I think we talk a little bit about that here on uh, question eight. We're going to talk about some of the shapes that they could have. Uh, but you can even just see by looking at them here, right? I mean, you've got kind of some spherical shapes. You've got some that kind of have these little, little, uh, I don't know what you call it, little claws on the end. Some of them are just a long helix, right? Just a long, like a stranded, uh, coiled piece of rope. 
Um, and then some of them are just tiny little, there are all kinds of different shapes of, of viruses. Uh, this is a picture, we think, of the coronavirus. Now, they've colorized it to try to show you a little bit of what it's like, but you've got this, again, protein coating, but then also you've got these little barbs, and that's what can attach to especially the tissue inside our lungs, and that's what allows this virus to get into our tissues, reproduce itself. That's actually what's killing people. This virus is, is getting so... Uh, fibrous. It just literally covers your lungs. And what's happening is our body is trying to protect against it and gets inflamed and kind of swells up. And so we're actually hurting ourselves a little bit because we're trying to get rid of this virus. And in the process, we make it where it's hard to breathe. And our body, um, especially some people that are older or already have respiratory problems, are having a real problem with this, this corona, coronavirus. So let's talk about a few of the shapes. So how would you describe this shape right here? Got this twisted shape. This is called a, a helical, right? Helical shape, you can write that down. So that one you're gonna to wanna to write right here, 8A, helical viruses. They're long, they're cylindrical. The very first virus discovered, that's what the picture over here on the right is, tobacco mosaic virus. So we're, for each one, we're giving you a shape and we're giving you one virus that has that shape just as a, a tool to remember and to learn by. So in this case, we've got the helical viruses. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, most of these are in plants, not humans. Uh, and one of the ones, the very first virus to discover was one of those. It looks just like this, kind of these long tubes, tobacco mosaic virus, which was the very first virus that was identified. Um, this is a polyhedral shape, all right? I know it looks kind of spherical, but it actually has some geometry to it almost like a soccer ball, okay? Has a bunch of different sides, but it also kind of looks like a ball. And then it often has these little points that stick out like the coronavirus does. Um, the coronavirus is actually very similar to the virus that causes the common cold, right? Which is called rhinovirus. Um, you know, a rhino is known for its big horn, right? It's big nose, it's actually a horn, but big nose on the front there. And, and the uh, humans, we call that the same thing. If you ever had nose surgery, nose job, it's a rhinoplasty, all right? It's working on your nose, your rhino. So a rhinovirus is a nose virus. It's a, it's a common cold. It causes runny nose, causes sneezing, uh, sometimes itchy eyes. Almost all of us have a rhinovirus every single year. It's one of the most common viruses on the planet. However, the symptoms are pretty minor, right? Usually you're a little stuffy, sneezy. You might be uncomfortable for a few days, maybe some headache, congestion, but usually it clears up in a week or two and you're able to go on with, with life. We even call it the common cold because it often happens during the winter when it is cold. We'll talk about that more a little bit later, why that is so. Well, the problem with the Corinza virus, which is what we're having right now, the, 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 cor the um, uh, uh, coronavirus, is that it's uh, similar to the cold, but it's deadly unlike the common cold. And so that makes it a lot more serious, but it has a similar shape as, as this does, um, which is uh, the rhinovirus is the most common virus infectious agent in humans. Um, the third shape we wanna talk about is complex. Now here's an example of the smallpox uh, virus, all right? You can see a picture of it here. It's got kind of this head, which is gonna have the genetic code inside of it. And then it's got a little bit of the helical. It's kind of a combination. I mean, you got a polyhedral part and you got a helix part. You got both. So that's why we call it complex. It's not simple. It's multiple shapes together. You've got some little sticky things sticking out here that stick in. It's got both of those. So this is kind of both together is what it means by when we say complex. An example of that would be the variola or the smallpox causes smallpox vaccine. A lot of us haven't heard of that before. Um, but you realize a lot of Native Americans died of smallpox, quite a lot. And it used to be a, a deadly disease. It's only in my lifetime that we've eradicated smallpox, which is amazing. Um, I think I probably got a smallpox vaccine when I was a kid. Nowadays, kids don't even get it, I don't think, anymore sometimes because it's, it's, almost basically, it's basically been eradicated. We have a, a few pieces of it left in labs, and hopefully that's, uh, that's all we, we have of the, of the smallpox. But it used to be fairly deadly, and it was uh, something that could definitely hurt people. Um, one of your most famous viruses 
is the influenza, the flu virus. And it has a envelope on the outside, okay? And you can kind of see, if you look closely here, I mean, it looks just kind of like a blob, but the key is there's this, this thicker outer protein shell, and you can see it actually is helical kind of inside, right? There's genetic code inside here, and it wraps around itself, but on the outside, there's an extra layer, an extra envelope, an outer layer to that virus. It allows it to be a little bit more durable in some environments, and that's why the flu has a tendency to infect people literally every single year. Uh, often, it's, it's been one of our more deadly um, viruses, and we, a lot of people are comparing this coronavirus to the flu because all of us know what the flu is. Most of us have either had it one year or the other. I think, was it back in 2009 with the swine flu? Uh, it was particularly contagious and a little worse than normal. And a lot of people got the flu that year. Um, even a lot of people, especially older adults, get flu shots every year because we know that the flu um, can, be, can be very serious. So those are your, eight, your four main shapes, okay? Uh, a helical, polyhedral, complex, envelope, and examples of that would be the tobacco is the helical, the rhinovirus is the polyhedral, the smallpox is the complex, the influenza is the envelope. So how does the virus work? All right, we're not going to explain everything, but let's just go over a little bit of, of explanation here. So you've got a human cell, okay? This virus will float along, comes through the air, comes through stuff that we touch. Sometimes it comes through what we eat. Depends on the virus, depends on how it's transmitted. But that virus will touch our cells. And usually there's something on the virus that allows it to connect and attach to our cells. Once it does that, it's almost kind of like a key fitting into a lock. It's like it's able to get access to the inside of this, of this cell. So once it attaches to the cell, right? In this case, we've got an actual bacteria, a little one cell organism, okay? Not a very big organism. But the virus has attached itself to the wall of that, that organism. And now the genetic code inside of that virus, whoop, it goes inside the cell. And the problem is it's going to take over this cell. Maybe this cell used to generate energy. Maybe this cell was to help remove waste in our human body. Maybe this cell, there's all kinds of things our cells that do. We have muscular cells. We have cells that help us with our heart and our blood and our immune system. But this genetic code, once it goes in here, whatever this cell was doing before, it stops because this genetic code takes over the cell. And now the cell works 100% of the time reproducing that virus. It's almost like somebody breaks into a mainframe computer. Somebody takes over the steering wheel of your car. Once they, if they've got control of the pedals and the steering wheel, they control the car, where it goes, how fast it goes, whatever happens to everybody inside. Same thing here. And so the virus tells the cell, I got new orders for you. I want you to stop what you were doing. I want you to reproduce a whole bunch of me. <laughs> well, it does that. And eventually the cell either overworks itself or runs out of energy or doesn't take care of itself. There's all kinds of ways this could go wrong. But chances are the cell's not going to survive this. doesn't do well. And when the cell dies, all these copies of the virus are released to then go out and infect more cells, and the process starts all over again. That's why there's such a problem. In fact, even today, the word virus is used to describe something that has a tendency to spread rapidly. You ever heard of a viral video? That means one person liked it, and then before you know it, a million people were laughing at it, right? You ever heard of a computer virus? It means one teenager somewhere, you know, made this program that's a little mean, a little malicious, and next thing you know, it's on everybody's computer because one computer then says, hey, let's reproduce it. Hey, let's reproduce it, and causing it to go all over. That's the same thing that happens here in real life with these little virus. They reproduce themselves and spread all over at a very rapid rate. So question nine, when a virus and you're infected with one of a, a virus, what happens is the genetic material takes over. Many of the cell functions, once the virus gets inside, instructs it to produce more of itself. Most viral infections eventually result in the death of the host cell. That's why we get sick. 
that's why we don't do well, you know? If all of a sudden all the cells in your body that normally keep you healthy and happy are either busy doing other things, working for the virus, or they're dying. They literally are dying because this, all they've done is made virus and then they don't work anymore. That's what causes us to be sick. And our body's not able to make new cells fast enough to the rate at which we're losing them, and we start getting sicker and sicker. And of course, viruses can take people's, take people's lives. So again, trying to show you how it works. Virus comes down here, attaches itself to a human cell. Once it attaches, the genetic code comes out of the virus into the cell and takes over. Well, how do we prevent this then? All right. There's really only one way that we know of, and that is we've basically got to stop the virus getting into the cell. And the way the body has a natural way, and it's amazing, God has given us an amazing gift. The body has in a way of preventing this from happening. It's called antibodies. It's the answer there to question 10. Antibodies. Antibodies are produced and they can neutralize the virus. How do they do that? Well, in this case, you've got this virus here, right? What if we covered it, right? And remember, there's these little teeny little things maybe that stick out of the virus, right? Well, what if instead of allowing it to connect to the cell, we cover it up with these antibodies? Now when it tries to catch to the cell, maybe it'll get stuck here a little, but the, but the genetic material can't get out. It can't fully connect. Some of them, the antibodies actually attach to the human cells, but they block the virus from attaching. Either way, whatever you can do, if you can keep the virus from attaching to the human cell, if you can keep the virus from releasing its genetic code, you stopped. You stopped it from reproducing, you've stopped a person from getting sick. So our body is amazing and is able to make these antibodies. Now, if a virus is small, antibodies are really tiny and they're very unique. They have to be the exact match of the virus or where it's attaching to the human body, an exact match. And so that's why you might have antibodies for one virus, uh, the flu, and the next year the flu will change a little bit and the virus will look just a little different, your antibodies don't work anymore. And that's why you have to, your body has to make new antibodies or like some people, they get the flu shot every year to try to prevent um, that virus from, from hurting them. They wanna get the antibodies that, that match. So question 10, how do we fight viruses when the infected with the virus? We have to have antibodies. That's what's produced by our body that neutralizes the virus, interferes with it binding with the receptors in the host cells. So question 11, the answer is vaccines. Vaccines have been developed to help Im immunity by imitating the infection. All right. Now, again, this is a little complicated. Let's see if I can make it as simple as I possibly can. If I give your body a little piece of the virus, okay, then your, your body is going to start making vaccines for it. Yeah, start making antibodies for it and you're gonna be able to defend yourself from it. But here's the problem. If your body doesn't do that fast enough, that little virus is gonna grow inside you and you're still gonna get sick. So that's a little risky. They also discovered, but what if I give you a virus that's inactive? What if I give you a little piece of the virus, polio, but it doesn't work anymore? It's, it's been treated in a way that it's inactive. It's not, you could even say you killed it. You killed the virus. It's not going to reproduce. But your body looks at it and goes, hey, you're a virus. There's more like you on its way. I better start making antibodies. And so sure enough, that's what a vaccine does. It basically tells your body, start making antibodies, start getting to work. And it gives your body, hopefully, a head start to fend off the real virus when it comes, if it comes, to make to make you sick some vaccines will even last for life because your body will keep those antibodies in your in your blood forever the rest of your life to be able to fend off some of them you have to have new ones every so often sometimes the the virus changes so rapidly we have to have new vaccines um, fairly fairly rapidly um, the body creates these antibodies it has to match exactly the virus that's the trick here that's how it neutralizes it and it allows you to be able to survive. Um, question 12, antibiotics do not 
work on viruses. Repeat that. Antibiotics do not work on viruses. Now, I'll have, every now and then you'll have somebody who gets sick and they say, well, let's go to the doctor. Let me get penicillin. Let me get an antibiotic. There's these pills I can take and I'll be better before you know it. There is no antibiotic that will treat the flu, the coronavirus, any of these things. There are some antivirals, but those aren't antibiotics. Antibiotics treat against diseases caused by bacteria, right? You can get a food poisoning that can make you sick for days, even weeks. You can get an antibiotic for that. Um, you could have a fever. You could have a strep throat. Strep throat caused by a bacteria. Get an antibiotic. You'll be better. Uh, uh, cholera, right? One of the most deadly diseases on the planet. It's caused by a bacteria. Antibiotics will, will help you. But the viruses are different. Antibiotics will not help any viruses ever, never. And if we give you antibiotics and you don't need them, that actually could cause antibiotic resistance. And so you'll see a lot of doctors now that are more careful than they used to be. If you have an ear infection, if you have a bad cold, they don't just give you antibiotics right away because A, it's not gonna help you, and B, it might actually hurt all of us in the long run because your body will then have a tendency to perhaps generate some superbugs that could cause a, a problem for everybody everybody later. So now there is some controversy I know about vaccines. Um, some parents refuse or delay or even they're hesitant to vaccinate their children. Uh, maybe they have religious reasons, personal beliefs, uh, philosophical reasons, or, or safety concerns. Um, just so you know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, typically we have encouraged uh, responsible immunization. Uh, we've encouraged vaccination, but we do leave the decision up to the individual family um, and, and, and adults as they get older. Um, so you'll want to talk to your, your parents about it and, and see what your beliefs on this might be. I personally have been vaccinated. I was vaccinated as a kid. I vaccinated all my children uh, because to me, the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, there are risks and it would be good to be educated on that. Our vaccines need to be made safely and they need to be made properly. And that's something that I believe is always hopefully going to be improving. But we live in a sinful world and there's nothing in this world that's perfect. Uh, including including vaccines as well. Um, so again, how do vaccines work? Uh, you take a weak or killed form of the disease, an inactive form of the disease. There's a, there's a lot of misinformation about vaccines too, um, just to be fair. Um, you cannot get um, a disease from a vaccine, okay? That the actual disease that you're treating, it literally is impossible. Um, and if it's done properly and everything, the body creates these antibodies, right? And then later, if the actual disease shows up, you'll already have the antibodies reducing or preventing the disease from causing you um, any symptoms. To me, this is key. Look at this right here. This is a chart of measles cases. Um, I'm actually deaf in one ear. Not everybody knows that, but this ear right here doesn't work. Probably because I had measles as a baby. Don't know for sure. Um, measles can cause some pretty serious symptoms, especially when you're young. Uh, I either didn't get my vaccine in time, which is probably what happened, or um, sometimes you can even, you know, um, get it before, uh, but, you know, before you get the vaccine. I, I'm not sure, we're not sure exactly what happened, but um, if you look at the time period here, see, I was born, I was born right about here, <laughs> right as they were just starting to really vaccinate people more frequently, and it started to make a big, big effect. Um, look at how many thousands of people um, used to have measles, and now it's, it's, you barely, you probably don't even know anybody in your entire life who's had measles, um, which is amazing. And measles can be, can be fatal. It can be, can be serious and can cause problems. Polio, similar story. Uh, used to affect tens of thousands of people. Um, I have people in my family that have had polio a couple generations back. and affect your legs, can cause you to have to uh, breathe through a respirator. Back in the old days, they had these iron lungs. Very sad. Um, now, polio is almost eradicated. And both of these, 100% due to vaccines. So vaccines overall have been proven to be, to be very uh, effective. Question 14, mutating viruses. Viruses are continuously mutating. So you'll want to write that down for the blank there on 14, mutating. What does that mean? That means they change, right? The genetic code in the virus changes a little bit causing the virus to change a little bit, maybe the receptors to change, maybe the little bit of the size or how it works. And the fact that it mutates is what makes viruses so tricky. 
because what happens is there's always a new virus, slightly different from the old one, and that's our problem. Um, whenever they create a new virus, they call it a novel virus. Uh, most novel viruses are from animals, and they've all of a sudden they've been making animals sick maybe even for years, but all of a sudden they cross over into us. We have no antibodies or even anything close to it that can help us, and all of a sudden we get all sick. That's kind of what's happening right now with the coronavirus. It's novel, it's new. We think it came from some animals originally, and now all of a sudden it's just a little bit different than the other coronaviruses that have been getting us sick for years, but it's just different enough. We've never seen it before in our bodies. We don't have any antibodies, and it's causing a lot of, a lot of problems. Um, you can also get resistance to mutations. Um, this is where it, it can become resistant to treatment or maybe even to a vaccine, again, usually due to the uh, mutation of it. Uh, there's also some antiviral drugs that can work, and then sometimes after a while, the virus can adapt to that, and then our medicines no longer work. Um, smallpox is a good story. Let's talk about some good stories. Number 16 here, the smallpox vaccine, vaccine has made a, a huge difference. It's literally considered eradicated. And I challenge you, go look in the history books on smallpox. This killed tens of thousands, maybe even millions of Native Americans when we came over from Europe. We'd been having smallpox for years. A lot of us had antibodies for it, Europeans, but the Native Americans did not, and they got very sick and they died. But now, after 200 years of vaccines and treatments, the disease is basically eradicated. The last person to have smallpox was back in the late 70s. Um, they actually declared in 1980 that, that it's completely eradicated. So that is, that is an incredibly good news. If you find a vaccine for a virus, and if you give everyone that vaccine, you literally can eradicate a virus. Um, the trick is not all viruses have vaccines, okay? And then second of all, even if you discover one, how do you make sure 7 billion, 8 billion people on planet Earth get this vaccine? That's the tricky part. So even right now, polio is almost eradicated. Why isn't it? Because some of these countries, especially the ones that are very poor, that are developing, it's hard to go to a village and find every single person and make sure that they all have the vaccine in time to prevent disease. Some of them are afraid, some of them don't know. How do you reach them? How do you educate them? How do you even fund to make that happen? Um, it's a very expensive, billions of dollars have to be spent to try to somehow treat the entire planet uh, of, a, of a virus. Um, so viruses are very difficult to treat. Um, they're very difficult because they're so small, you can't see them. Um, they're, they're, they're not really living things, so how do you kill a non-living thing? <laughs> you can't. You can only make them inactive, and some of them are pretty tough, pretty tough. They're easy to spread. Um, they often have this outer layer that even makes the body, it's hard for the body to identify that it's a virus. It looks like a good thing at first. That's why the body lets it in. Uh, antibiotics don't work on, on viruses. And often you can be infected, you can be contagious and not even know it. That's what's happening we think with this coronavirus. People are infected, people are sick, they're spreading it to other people, but they don't feel sick. I don't have a temperature. I'm not, I'm not having trouble breathing, I don't feel sick. And then all of a sudden the symptoms will come, but they've actually been sick for days and they didn't realize it. And their family's got the disease and their friends have got it. And, that's why right now they're trying to shut everything down and prevent us from traveling and social distancing, all this stuff. We're trying to prevent a disease that's probably a lot worse than even we realize. Because the numbers they show you on TV, the numbers that everybody's talking about, those are just the numbers of people that have symptoms, that we know are, are sick. We really have no idea how many people actually have the virus. And if you think about it, if there's one person who's sick, they got it from somebody. And we don't always know who that somebody is, and they might have given it to someone else already, and that person to someone else. That's why it's spreading so fast and all over. Viruses are very difficult to treat and contain. Um, vaccine programs are really the most effective that we know of so far to treat, to treat viruses. The only problem with vaccines, it takes time. Uh, this coronavirus, for example, it's tell, they're, they're saying it'll take at least a year to create one. And the truth is, you ever heard of a cold vaccine, a vaccine for the common cold? We don't really have one. Some viruses we have no vaccine for, even now. It's been very difficult to create vaccines for some viruses. And where a lot of science, a lot of research is going into that, but 
sometimes it's, it's very difficult. So question 18, we're just going to contrast and compare a few viruses. Um, this one is the cold, rhinovirus, and influenza or the flu, okay? And we're just going to go over just to some of these so you can kind of understand the difference because a lot of people get these, these confused. And these are generalizations, right? So don't hold me to these. Uh, you're welcome to go back and do some more research. I would encourage you, uh, you know, Mayo Clinic. Uh, there's a lot of good places, National Institute of Health, Medline. There's a lot of places where you can get reputable information about diseases, about conditions, about symptoms, and learn a little bit more about these if you like. Um, the cold, typically the symptoms come on gradually, whereas the flu, you're feeling great, and all of a sudden, boom, you're miserable. You're sick, you're achy, you're fevery. The flu has a tendency to be a lot more abrupt, okay? Um, the cold, does it have a fever? Rarely, okay? Usually not. Uh, flu, almost always you have a fever, okay? Fever is usually defined over uh, one degree Celsius than your normal temperature, so that's basically over 100 degrees, right? 100.4 or more uh, is usually considered a fever. Um, cold doesn't usually have much aches and pains. Flu typically does. You're kind of achy all over. You feel sore all over. You know, haven't done anything. Uh, it's like you played a really hard game of tennis, but you know you didn't. <laughs> so that's the flu. Um, chills, again, not common with the cold. Uh, flu, it usually is. All of a sudden, you'll have this, whoo, and you know you're warm. You might even have a blanket on, and yet you feel really cold. And then all of a sudden, you might go to really hot, too. You might go back and forth. That's often common with the flu, uh, not so much with the common cold. Um, fatigue and weakness, sometimes with a cold, I mean, you feel kind of bleh, you know, I don't really want to go to work, I don't want to go to school, but you, you, usually you do, you usually are able to make it. The flu, not so much, you might be so tired and so weak, you'll stay at home with the flu, usually, um, especially if you have it pretty good, you'll, you'll be sick. Um, the cold often causes sneezing, stuffy nose, sore throat, those are your typical cold symptoms. The flu kind of rarely has those, or sometimes sneezing, stuffy nose. That's not the identifying mark of the flu. So to me, I always look for things like sudden onset, right? That's pretty different. Fever is more likely to be the flu. Symptoms are usually more severe, typically for the flu. Um, chest get discomfort could be in both. Headache, pretty rare in the cold, although sometimes you'll have a head cold, they call it. It's actually probably sinusitis, but... Um, sinus problems, that's a whole other thing, but um, flu, you almost always have aches, especially in your head as well. So you get some of, the, some of the differences here. The other sad thing is the cold really doesn't kill anybody, okay? Um, the flu kills tens of thousands of people every year around the world, especially a lot of older people. Um, often it leads to pneumonia and some other problems, but it, it can be serious. That's why you get flu shots, or, or some people do, especially older people. Uh, when I was a pastor, I got a flu shot every year. Not because I needed it, but I visited the elderly. I went to nursing homes. I didn't want to accidentally bring some dear, sweet old lady the flu, when, and she might not survive, and I would be okay because I was a little younger. So the flu can be serious. Um, I've had the flu before where I was sick for two weeks, very sick. Uh, maybe some of you have had a bad case of the flu. If you get over it just a day or two, you probably didn't have the flu. You might have had a bad cold. Chances are you didn't really, really have the flu. Nowadays, they can actually test you, and they'll tell you whether you what exactly you have uh, if they feel that your symptoms uh, warrant that. Um, question 19. Why do we call the common cold the cold? Because it often happens in the wintertime. Uh, wintertime is a common time to have respiratory problems, and there's a reason for that. Uh, we're, we spend more time indoors. We're closer together. So we have diseases all year long, but the winter, we're closer to each other. Uh, the winter also has chilly, dry air causing our lungs to be a little more susceptible to respiratory problems. So the flu really spikes in the winter. The cold really spikes in the winter. This coronavirus, when did it start? In the winter. And hopefully, maybe, it'll die out in the summer, right? That's what we're praying for. Because the flu usually dies out every summer. The common cold has a tendency to die out every summer as, as well. They don't really die out. It's just, it's, it's not as common. They're not as infectious. And so they all of a sudden kind of disappear from our, our memory and then they come roaring back next winter. Um, every year though, question 20, we have a seasonal outbreak of the flu every year. And typically what happens, you, you say, well, how do they know when to make these flu shots? 
Well, when we're having the summer, what are they having in South America? The winter, right? We kind of have opposite seasons. So guess what? They often get the flu before we do, or we'll get the flu before they do. They will actually go to these other countries and get, make the vaccine for the flu based on what other people are getting sick with, and then we get the vaccine to follow that, to try to offset the diseases that are, that are covering our, our planet. But the flu is a very, uh, mutates every year. It's very infectious, causes people to get sick just about every year. And some years are worse than others. Now, most of us do not remember, but in 1918, there was a really bad flu, um, the great pandemic. Um, it infected 20, 25, up to 40% of the population, killed a lot of people, including young people, young adults. That was, it was one of the more deadly of the flus. They estimate 50 million people died on this planet. That's a lot of people. And it was a really bad case of the flu. Our, our fear is that a flu like this will come back someday. Uh, either a swine flu or a bird flu that'll you know, mutate, come back into humans, and cause a worldwide pandemic. In a way, that's kind of what we're happening with this coronavirus. Um, praise the Lord, it's only you know, one to 2% of, of people in America are dying from it. But I mean, you go to places like Italy, they're having like 10% people die from it. Um, this flu back in 1918 was 20, 25% of people, 30% of people were dying from it. So that's, that's bad. Um, let's talk about just some other diseases that cause rash. Um, I think I've got three of them for you here. So what you want to do is going to write these three names at the top of your chart there. Um, rubella, these are ones you probably have received if you, if you go to school or a lot of places you've probably already got a vaccine for this. You would have got it when you are younger. Um, rubella um, is a vaccine that the BRN is a measurement of how infectious a disease is. So the higher the number, the worse it is, the more likely it is to spread. So you can see that rubella is not as bad as the measles. Measles is the worst of the three. Um, and then the uh, fatal rate is that CFR, okay? How, how often do people die? Um, so rubella does not kill too many people, right? Especially adults, very few. Well, then why is it even a disease? Well, if a mother has it and she's giving a birth to a baby, that baby could die. It causes very serious problems in infants and babies if the mother has an active infection right as she's giving birth. That's the whole reason we treat it. That's the whole reason we're serious. Um, most adults, it's just fever, sore throat, a rash, but it can kill babies. And it's very fatal, like 20, 30% of babies, if their mother has an active infection when they're born, they'll die. It can be very serious. So rubella is something that we take seriously. Measles is something that's very serious. Uh, one to 3% of humans who get it will die. And it causes a lot of serious uh, deformities. I'm deaf in one ear because of it probably. Um, it can cause other problems as well. Um, often it also causes fever and rash, runny nose, watery eyes. Uh, most of you probably had a vaccine for measles. It's, it's pretty serious. Chicken pox, when I was a little boy, uh, almost every kid got this. <laughs> And you'd all get these little bumps. I had little bumps all over my skin. One kid would get it. And the next thing you know, the whole class has got it. And you know, most of the time you got over it, you survived. You might have a little, couple little scars on your body from where the chicken pox had been. It's like little bumps, like a bunch of little warts that break out and then they go away in a couple weeks. But it can be serious. And again, it can be serious in adults. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in infants. So uh, yes, only 0.02% of adults die from it. But the infant's not so good, right? So you don't want to be an infant with chicken pox. Um, otherwise, it, it causes blister rash, itching fever, and, and tiredness. Pretty infectious, but still less than measles. Um, this coronavirus, we don't still exactly have a number. It's less than measles, but it's more than the flu. Uh, probably 20 times more contagious. Let's see, am I saying this right? It's quite a few times more contagious than the flu um, and more deadly. I think it's 20 times more deadly than the, than the flu, so it's serious. Um, now, for the viral virus's honor, you're going to have to do these last two parts on your own, okay? Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, page four of my handout actually has all the answers for today's presentation for you there. So if you missed anything, you can go back and check your answers. I want you to learn. I'm not here to just test you. Hopefully, your Pathfinder director, you're going to want to show this to them and be able to demonstrate that you really know your stuff. 
But question 23 says choose three virus diseases and be able to describe how the infection happens, the symptoms, how you prevent it. Okay, so we're going to go over just a few here in a moment. And then you're also going to want to give a report on a pandemic uh, or, or do a skit on a virus or, or have a health worker, relief worker give you a presentation. So these are things you're going to have to do on, on, your, on your own. But let me just, uh, the rest of your handout here, I've got, what, uh, four or five more pages. Some of these you might want to go and double check and, and update on because I might not have the latest information. But let's just go over uh, a few of these. So we went over rubella, okay? And you can go online, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control. Uh, their headquarters is in Atlanta. That's the United States headquarters for infectious disease. They study viruses. They have a lot of good information on measles, the flu. That's where some of these... Um, come from these charts. Uh, they're also leading our fight against the coronavirus, the CDC is. So they're a great resource. Um, but rubella will tell you here, tells you the symptoms, some of the complications. Remember I said it can cause miscarriages, stillbirths in the babies that are born there uh, with the mothers, that's sad. Um, but now there's a vaccine for it. Measles. So they've got these neat charts and it tells you what some of the symptoms are, tells you uh, you know how you know, measles used to hospitalize 25% of the people who got it. That's see, that's serious. Um, that's why we have a vaccine for it now. Um, chicken pox, you get all these little bumps all over you. I remember kids would make fun of you when you came to school with all the bumps. You know, next thing you know, a week later, they've got all the bumps. <laughs> so everybody got the bumps back in the day. But now we've got a vaccine for it, which is which is better. Um, and uh, herpes is a virus that probably all of us have. You probably listening to me today, 95% of the human race has the uh, oral uh, mouth herpes virus. Um, it's related to the chickenpox virus. It has some things in common with it. Um, the, uh, the herpes virus uh, causes like cold sores on your lips. Uh, if you've ever had a cold sore, it's kind of like an ulcer, a little bump on there, and it maybe last a week or so, and then it'll often go away. Sometimes herpes, when you get older, can turn into another disease, another symptom, another syndrome called shingles, where you get some real pain and, and some problems there. Uh, usually happens on your body on these dorsal regions, follows a, a line of nerves, um, but uh, a lot of people it, it doesn't affect them at all. Um, in my handout, I've got several of these just for you to go through, but you might want to look up some of these yourself. Um, I talked a little bit about herpes. I talked about how you can get it. Uh, 50 to 90 percent of adults already have it. Uh, most children have it. Most of the time, the uh, symptoms are pretty mild. The, the blisters on your mouth is the main thing. Um, what can you do? There's really not much treatment. We don't have a vaccine for the oral herpes, but we uh, do have some antivirals if you get the like shingles uh, that they might, they might give you for that. Um, avoiding contact when you have a cold blister is good. Um, also, you know, not touching other people's glasses and cups. That's one reason why you don't drink after other people. Uh, to prevent the herpes. Uh, mumps, there's, I got a whole page here on mumps for you that you can read over. Uh, I've got a whole page on viral meningitis. You can read about that, what, it, what, what causes it, how it's spread, how it's treated. Hepatitis, there's actually, what, four kinds, five kinds of hepatitis, A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, and all, hepatitis means inflammation of the liver. So these are all viruses that, that affect our liver, which is an important organ. And you can find out why it's important and what it causes, what the problem with it is. And the very last page in my handout, page nine, is the coronavirus. So let me just take a moment to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the information on the coronavirus is changing. We're learning new things every day. Um, from what I understand so far, the coronavirus is a respiratory virus, meaning you get it from breathing, okay? That's why we're trying to separate from everybody. Uh, you don't usually get it from eating it in your food. You don't get it from touching surfaces. You get it from breathing. So if you're near someone else who has it and they cough, they sneeze, they breathe, anything, little pieces of that virus come out of their mouth, come into your lungs, and then you're going to get it as, as well. So that's why we're all separating. That's why the government isn't shutting everything down, is to try to prevent people from breathing in each other's space. Um, it's causing people to get it all over the world, all over the United States. Uh, you can go online and find the latest ca case count there. Um, the symptoms when you do get it, it's, uh, it can be mild. It can vary where you just have a little bit of a fever, maybe some respiratory symptoms, 
uh, it can cause uh, death, can cause problems where you have to go to the hospital. So that's, that's the real problem. We're trying to prevent uh, everybody from getting sick at once. I was trying to see if I had, no, I didn't have that. Um, I uh, had a chart where it's basically, if you go back to 1918 um, in the flu, you will see that there's two cities, Philadelphia and uh, St. Louis. Uh, Philadelphia said, hey, we're not gonna do anything. And 200,000 people all came out for a big parade Three days later, all their hospitals were full of people with the flu dying. Thousands of people died before that week was out. Um, what happens is if everybody gets sick at once, our hospitals can't take it, can't handle it all. And people are going to get hurt. People are going to die. Uh, St. Louis closed all their schools, closed their libraries, canceled their parades, told everybody to take a break. A lot of people still got the flu, but not all at once. And they were able to have less deaths, less people in the hospital at once, and they were able to do better. So that's what I think we're trying to do with this coronavirus. We don't want to panic. We don't want to go out there and buy every roll of toilet paper in the world. We're okay. Take it easy. We're pathfinders. We're not going to panic. We're going to be people that are calm. We're going to trust in God. We're going to trust that he'll bring us through this. But we can follow some good practical advice. Wash our hands. Try to touch our face less. These are all ways that we can put that virus up closer to our nose. Um, try to give ourselves space from other people, all right, for the next few weeks. If anybody we know, if we are sick ourselves, we got to stay home because we're only going to put other people at risk. Um, the masks are mainly for people who are already sick or feel those that are working with the sick, like healthcare workers. Um, it can help you a little, and it also can remind you not to touch your face so much. But I don't know if we've got enough masks for everybody to wear them right now. So we need to keep them for those that are sick and those that are, are the, the health care workers. There's no vaccine yet for the coronavirus. There might not be um, this whole year. Um, and we'll just have to see how that goes. They might have come up with some other treatments. I know there's a lot of scientists right now working very hard on it. And we'll just have to see how it goes. Prevention is always the best cure for viruses. Don't get it and you won't have to deal with it. So I want to just end with a word of prayer for our country and for you as a pathfinder that you'll have courage and that you'll continue to let knowledge and learn more about viruses and things in ways that will help you uh, be a positive influence. So let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so much for the fact that you have given us an amazing set of pathfinders. Uh, the second ministry in the entire Adventist church after only Sabbath school is our pathfinder clubs. Millions of young people all around the world that want to make a difference for you. Right now, it's kind of a scary time. There's a lot of concern about viruses. Help us to have knowledge and wisdom and make good choices to prevent the panic, to prevent the foolishness, and to be able to help people stay healthy, strong, and to survive this better on the other side. Help us to realize what really matters is our relationship to you. Everything else on earth is fragile and temporary. Help us to stay safe. Help us to stay strong. We thank you for your love. We thank you most of all for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Goodbye. God